Sorry, with the way it's on. Shaped up here again. The way we move over there if you want. I can't see the screen unless I'm going to move over. Firstly, welcome to the Folk Museum of Gloucester Local History Society. Um, I need to explain how this all started. It was a conversation between me and Roger, I think, on Facebook, where um, I knew Roger had always wanted to hear his dad's story told. So I offered, because the History Society produced journals, that I would write the story and we put it in a journal. Yeah. Now, when Roger turned up at the house with two huge carrier bags, I thought that's never going to fit in a journal. But I sat and read through it slowly and couldn't believe what I was reading. Because I remember Roger's dad and his mum, we'd go into Wellington, Mike was there, misbehaving, I felt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, no, I won't mention the churches. <laughs> um, and Hal was there, and I knew Hal had been a boxer, and I knew he'd been a pretty good boxer, but I didn't know the detail. So all I saw was uh, what I looked at as an old man, about the age I am now. He sat there, very smiley, very nice, sociable kind of guy. And the other thing that was different about him, although we were all, we had long hair, believe it or not, <laughs> I know I had loads of beads around my neck, and the whole 32-inch flare thing was going on. And most people would make nasty remarks to us if we walked down the street, but Hal never made one remark like that. Yeah? So, and because it was Roger's parents, Jay's parents, obviously, we treated them with respect. That's the way we were raised. So when I read through these notes, I couldn't quite believe it. The detail of the fights, because the smiley, Hal Bagwell, this nice, gentle old man, very sociable guy, was beating the living daylights in the guys for money. So I rolled a cigarette, made a cup of tea, and walked up and down the garden, come back and read it again. And I did that a number of times and then started to put it all together and realised just how much of a boxer he was, just how significant he was, and, and it was never going to fit into the journal of the Local History Society unless we had a Hal Bagwell special for the next three years. So then we started talking about a book and some way to remember his dad, because people are always saying, who's Hal Bagwell? And that the fact that they can't remember him, I think it's a bit disrespectful, and it, was, it wasn't just how, I've got about 120, 150 Gloucester boxers. The difference with Hal is, I met him, I know his children, and he was the best of all of them, easily. So, um, the book will be written eventually. I thought it was almost written until I spoke to Dick Shepherd. He gave me a copy, a scan from the Guinness Book of Records in the 70s, which made a claim about Hal, and then they withdrew it from the book. And we'll cover that as we go. But uh, I need to thank a few people as you've helped along the way. Firstly, the Bagwell family for taking over my entire life. Yeah. <laughs> I already speak to my wife. I need to thank my wife. She's supposed to be here. Oh. Family things tonight. Also, Pete Wilson for the interview he did on BBC Radio in Gloucestershire, which uh, I saw even Mike's got a tissue in his hand ready for tonight. <laughs> and I've already said, if anybody starts crying, I'm throwing them out because they've got me off my stride. The other person that needs to be thanked is Dick Shepherd, who I'm sure most of you remember from Gloucester Park. And uh, I contacted Dick because he's written two books, one about his life and one about his, uh, his various attempts to leap over things in Gloucester Park. He also did lots of other things, like the Italian job, and lots of other films he worked on, did some huge stunts, crazy stunts, and he's got his own publishing company. And when he came to me, I explained that the problem I've got with a publisher is the first time one of them says we want 45%, I know I'm going to use some extremely bad language, because it's about Hal Bagwell, not about them making a buck. Dick Shepard then said, you cover my costs, I won't make any profit from it. Because I met Hal Bagwell, he was a really nice bug, and he deserves it, based on the little I know about him. 
So, start from the beginning, I guess that little slide on this one. Start from the beginning then. I won't read it actually, I know you can all read. Born in 1918, these were his parents. <laughs> he started life, his nickname was Bubbles, because apparently there was a pair of soul advert around that time of a young, good looking boy with blonde, curly hair, and how it looked just like him. So he went through his life from Bubbles. In his unofficial fights from the age of 13, he was still being referred to as Bubbles back well. Yeah, not really a scary kind of name for a boxer, powerful, is it? So, uh, Billy Wagner, his trainer, and one of the promoters of the show decided to change his name to Hal Bagwell, because it sounded a bit more macho than Harold Douglas or Bubbles. But to people in Gloucester, and uh, further afield around the county, he became affectionately known as Baggy. I was told recently, that in the, one of the last fights, Charlton Town Hall, just the name Hal Bagwell would fill it to capacity, and there would be a queue outside with at least 200 people come to see Baggy and Roster fights. Now, there are many turning points in Hal's life, and one was when he woke up one morning and heard his mother crying in the kitchen. And when he went downstairs and asked why she was crying, she said it's because there's no food. I have nothing for your breakfast. Your dad's lost his job. It was one of these times of austerity. So there was no support for them whatsoever. They were on their own. So Hal, taking that in his stride, went off to school. He went to Treadworth Infants, Treadworth Juniors, and then Hadley Road School for Boys. Went off to Hadley Road, hungry. So we know these days, unable to kind of learn anything or focus on what the teacher was saying. But what was running through his head that day are the two younger boys he played with in the streets. Their names were Billy and Peter Wagner. Both of them were going to a boxing club run by their dad. Hal also knew their dad, his name was also Billy Wagner, Billy Wagner Sr. And he'd been the middleweight champion of the Southwest. And he'd spoken to Hal about the cash he'd made for fighting, showed him pictures of him proudly wearing his belt, and all sorts of other stories. So when Hal came home, he announced to his parents, I'm going to be a boxer. I'm going to make some money. We're going to have food on the table. Now, I'm sure parents, talking to a 12-year-old boy who wants to be a boxer, they're going to be slightly concerned, particularly as he's a pretty little boy with blonde curly hair. They probably don't want his face all mashed up. But his dad said to him, live clean and train hard. And he certainly did the second one. I'm not sure about the first one. <laughs> <coughs> so from his personal life, he married Wynn, St. Mary de Love, 1941. Three children, Robert, Jane and Roger. They met at a very early age. They started officially dating, age 16, and it was Wynne that suggested they get engaged. And you can see the date in terms of the Second World War is quite relevant, 1941, when lots of people were getting married, mainly because they didn't expect to see their other half again. This is Billy Wagner Sr., the man who run, run the India House Boxing Club, who gave Hal access three nights a week. It cost tuppence to go. Well, Hal didn't have tuppence three <coughs> nights a week. So I'm sure Billy Wagner saw something in Hal Bagwell. You get thrown with it, you cry. <laughs> and let him train for free. Hal was training also with Eddie Fry, the Gloucester Strongman. And the only reason Eddie Fry didn't take up boxing is because he didn't like punching people. So he'd do all the boxing training. He went and sparred with Hal Bagwell, but then would go home into his bedroom to build his muscles out and become a strongman. Dick Shepherd <coughs> told me I was never too stupid to go into the <coughs> house and get boxed up. But he knew the other two. In fact, um, the strongman suggested to Nick Shepherd that he thought of some way of making money. 
He said, I'll lie on the park, in the Costa Park, with a bed of nails pointing towards my chest, and you ride over with a motorbike with lands on the cash. Dick Shepherd said, yeah, I've got no problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> the other guy here is another Costa boxer, Tosh Wells, who's, uh, who will appear in the journal. This is Billy Wagner Sr. He was just won his belt. There's also another picture of him. He used to go to the, um, the art college in Gloucester and pose naked so they could draw pictures on him. Um, I don't think it's good to have that picture on him. He has got his legs crossed over. <laughs> um, but the reason the Wagners became more and more important as I was going through it is not just because Peter and Billy, his sons, were a friend of Al, although I saw a fight uh, last night of Hal in an exhibition bout with Billy Wagner Jr. and it didn't look like they'd been lifelong friends because Hal was beating the living daylights out of it, <laughs> despite the fact he's a welterweight. But it was this phrase that caught me, Hal consistently, when he referred to Billy Wagner, said he was like a father to me. And that's in radio interviews, it's just about every citizen in the newspaper. Those who found, although they always refer to him as Baggy, he was calling them Waggy, which made me smile yesterday, all the Waggies collectively. But I spoke earlier on the phone to a Malcolm Wagner who's related to these. Uh, he's 63 now. His mum is alive and well, and members, all of them, including Hal Bagwell. Um, and he laughed when I said, Hal used to call your family Waggy. He said that was my dad's nickname. He sparred with Hal. Everybody sparred with Hal. You had no choice, yeah? And he said that was my nickname as well, when I was boxing, Waggy. <coughs> so there is Hal's record, there's an issue in one bit, the other bit is completely undisputed. Right, so I want to kind of go through it gently, and some of this will be repeated because it's about burning into people's heads the significant thing about Hal Bagwell. His first unofficial fight, he was 13, fighting at mosquito weight. There is no such thing as that anymore, it's now lightweight or bantam weight. His first official fight, he was 17, he fought at the drill in Gloucester, he won, and he was paid five shillings. For anyone under 50, that's 25p. Yeah, huge amount of money. <coughs> the official fights were recorded, but it's still difficult to find. The unofficial fights are completely unrecorded. It's very difficult to find any evidence at all. I'm going to look again at those. But if you see the difference, 13 to 17, if how it depends what kind of fight he was having. But I wouldn't be surprised to discover he had three fights every week. So if you multiply that up by the number of years, yeah, you get some idea of the number of fights he could potentially have between 13 and 17 before he stepped in at the drill and got himself 25p. He also, 1936, he joined the Territorials, the 8th Battalion of the Gosha Regiment, and he also boxed for the Army. And again, Lots of those, there's no record of them. Particularly when the war kicked off, they didn't keep any records at all because there was something slightly more important going on. <coughs> now Hal, I don't know when he actually started, whether it was 13 or 14, but he was going to Taylor's boxing booth because I have been told by Ken Dahl, who can't be here tonight, Somebody else can't be here tonight. Malcolm Wagner wanted to be here, he couldn't make it. And Richard Painter, Senator of Guards, Gloucester type setting. I think it rings a bell. Rings a bell. Yeah, because I was like, I don't believe that shit. Yeah. Yeah. It rings a bell, yeah. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, he was fighting in Taylor's boxing booth, which is a bit risky if you're going in there as a customer, because in Ron Taylor's boxing booth, these boxes all have proper boxing gloves on. Strap three or four pillows to each of your fists, yeah, to lessen the impact on his voice. 
People think that Taylor's Boxing Boots was at Gloucester Fair for two weeks during the summer, but when it wasn't there, it was either travelling around the country or down past Westgate Bridge near Orney Island. And you can see there are a number of boxing boots around the UK. The one I hope to death that Hull missed out completely was Jack Sapper O'Neill's boxing boot, because he is the dodgiest boxer that ever came from Gloucester. We've also identified the dodgiest one from Cheltenham, and Cheltenham was far dodgier than Sapper <laughs> In those, we'll come back to the boxing boots actually, and what Hal did, because he ended up working for Ron Taylor. <coughs> so that, for if you remember, it's Ron Taylor himself calling up the Gloucester boys, who do you want to take on? <coughs> and Gloucester baths, mm -hmm. where they would cover over the pool, and Hal would fight lots of his early fights with Gloucester baths. Hal was fighting in the India House, in the ring they had above the pub, uh, Gloucester Baths, King's Home, he filled King's Home, he's possibly the largest crowd ever at King's Home, 25,000, Siren Sester, Bingham Hall, Chuxbury, Cheltenham, and then he expanded across the country. He even went to London, which um, was a bit of an issue of the London fight, which we'll cover in a minute. <coughs> So to cut to the chase, it was, I think it was Pete that said to me, well, you know how many fights in 1936? Uh, the answer I should have said is, because I haven't looked hard enough yet. Yeah, he had a lot more fights than that. And bear in mind, he was also fighting at Taylor's boxing booth. There's always the official fights and the unofficial fights. You'll see there, something's fairly consistent. Yeah, the wins. And I read in another boxing tournament, there were uh, five fights on one night, and the first two guys in the ring, they drew. So at the end of the night, the promoters made them get back into the ring to sort it out, because a draw wasn't acceptable. We needed to know who the winner, who the loser was. So you can see Jackie Hall, it's a draw on the 22nd of March. He's back already on the 6th of July to try and sort it out. It's still a draw. He gets a cut eye and is still not satisfied and comes back until he's beaten and then vanishes from Hal's record. <coughs> now, the one in blue is really important, Johnny King, because that's the loss. He knocked out Hal at King's home. And there are reasons for that, and again, I'll leave that till later, we're going into detail. But as we go through these, look for the blue text, because the next time you see blue text will be the end of his 10 years, three months undefeated period. There isn't a boxer on this planet that comes anywhere near that, and that's the biggest thing to show to about Hal Bagwell. Think about changing names, because Bubbles doesn't sound very macho, Hal Bagwell sounds a lot more macho. He's a real expert on names here. Tiger Pompbury. I checked him out and thought, well, he sounds a bit fierce, doesn't he? He was from Bristol. There's no Pompreys here, are there? Because I'm going to slag him off. <laughs> I checked his record. He had seven fights, two of them against Hal. Of the seven fights, he lost six, and the other one, he withdrew with an injury. That was against Hal. So Tiger, more like pussycat. <laughs> <coughs> God bless him. Oh, there it is, in fact. Yeah, he's on his way out. <clears throat> so the difference is how he goes through his boxing records. His first three or four fights are against Gloucester boys. They're sorting it out locally. Who's the best? Who's the best? Then he moves further afield into the Midlands. By the time he gets past Pussycat, these are serious players. Yeah, these are the boys headed for the title of championship. There's no easy fights to be had there, but you can see what's going on. <coughs> the one 
fight that stands out from this particular list is uh, September the 2nd, Jackie Turpin. That's the, the one that will come back to haunt Howard Bagwell later in life. Turpin was from Leamington Spa. There were four Turpin brothers. They all fight different ways. I think Jackie was no problem at all because uh, Hal knocked him out. But there was a conversation, because Hal got on very well with the Turpin brothers, so there was a conversation with one of the other Turpins that Hal met in a contest, and he, he explained, look, we get on really well, I get on well with all your brothers, we all like each other, but I've got an upper coming fight with Jackie. Now I really like him, see if he can get a substitute, because if he turns up to the fight, we're going to have to knock him out. But Jackie obviously was told up, but didn't listen, and you can see what the result was. <laughs> there he went. These are all, again, all serious boxers. Sid Morgan was the champion of Wales. Yeah? Drew a draw, he comes back to get beaten. Yeah, there's Sid Morgan coming back for a meeting, and that's the last time he shows. One of the other ones, um, Jimmy Jury. Jimmy Jury must have enjoyed getting beaten up. <laughs> Power one here, he comes back quite quickly, gets knocked out, comes back again, wins again. When he came to the reunion, Jimmy Jury was sat waiting for Hal to arrive with his pint. And as Hal, they opened the door and Hal walked in, he put his hands up here and said, Keep it away from me! Keep it away from me! <laughs> you see, Sid Morgan is there now with the win against him. <coughs> Maury Jones fight. That's the end of the 10 year, 3 months run. The closest boxer I can find, come anywhere near that, was uh, the guy that knocked Hal out. And his longest running streak was one year and three months. Hal's was ten years and three months. 1949 is a bit of a nasty thing to say, but every boxer has like a sell-by date. You can't box until you're 68, yeah? And 1949, Hal was starting to struggle. All right, as all boxers do. And you can see, yeah, takes his eye off the ball for a minute. The Bryn Davis one <coughs> is, uh, depending on your sense of humour, either a bit sad or extremely funny. They were fighting. There's um, one of Hal's friends made notes at the end of some of the fight summaries. And his excuse for this disqualification is a low punch. Because Hal was so small and they crouched to go into fight, Bryn Davis was much taller, and it all happened in one round, in an instant, that Hal, being really low, threw a punch. As Bryn Davis stepped in and stood up straight and threw a punch to get him down, Hal was headed for his stomach, but because he stood up, he hit him a little bit lower than that. <laughs> it's always the blokes that smile and wipe their eyes. <laughs> uh, he probably deserved it anyway. Moss Massini was also from Leamington Spa. I think his dad was also a fighter, Alf Mancini. They're an uh, Italian extraction. <coughs> we'll come to Moss. These are recent ones where I try to fill in the gaps because Ron Davis it was that put the pack together for Hal. <coughs> so when I was going through it, I didn't know whether he'd been to the archives and did it like in a consistent way to go through it because he was going to the fights. Did he just record things, the fights he went to? What was he doing? I have no idea. And he's not here to ask. Well, I think he recorded the fights he went to. And he got a few of the others, but there are lots of others now, because the internet's available. And these are the ones I need to fill in the gaps. You can see in 1936, I don't know if the result is, well, finally, I don't know where they fought. You can see where they're coming from. But these are all additional to the 100 already for Hull Bagbar. You can kind of guess the result of that one. Um, the one that shocked me, oh, that thing's in the way, the guy down the bottom in St. Helens, it's the date, 1950. Powell retired in 1949. That, it's unlikely that's an exhibition bout, 
because he's from St. Helens. Would he travel all the way to Gloucester? So that's the person I'm going to target when I get back in the archives, because I think Paul was having a fight after he'd stopped fighting. This is Hal at the India House preparing to meet Johnny King, the one on the left. You see the Leviton Spa guys with their belts on, standing there proudly. <coughs> this, I think, is uh, the only picture I got of Billy Wagner Jr. What used to happen at um, half past six in the morning, Billy Wagner would knock on the door of Baggy's house and they'd go for an eight mile run. The two Wagner boys would go with them. But the two Wagner boys, I've got it on the, the radio interview, Peter laughing, saying we used to try and keep up with my dad and Hal, but we used to laugh at each other, who's going to collapse first? Yeah? And he said my brother hated running, it was quite often him that collapsed, and I collapsed just afterwards, and we sit on the floor and wait for him to come back, but Hal and my dad would do eight miles. Well, when a big fight like this was coming up, it wouldn't be Monday to Friday, it would be seven days a week, and quite often more than eight miles. Every boxer in the India house would make themselves available, and Hal would jump in and spar with them, regardless of what weight they were, what size they were, or anything else. <coughs> you see, it's the difference when you look back on things now, <clears throat> because with a fight coming up, Hal was fighting for money. No doubt about it, he'd been starving to death. He was fighting for money. I think he got his belt because it just naturally got there. He was always fighting for money. Billy Wagner was also interested in money for exactly the same reason. See, you got hands like a shovel. Mm -hmm. If he slapped you in the face, he's getting the whole thing in one go. Come on, look at his ears. <laughs> he's a monster. For Hal, that was fight 27. For Johnny King, it was fight 201. Looking back on it now, it's easy to say, but if you look at Johnny King's record, and I'd have been Billy Wagner, I'd have put that fight back one year. Because Johnny King was then past his cell by date, and he was starting to slide a bit, and Hal would have put him down. Yeah? Just went in, full of money, a bit young, taking a chance, and he paid the price. But he's still smiling, huh? <laughs> He said after that fight, Johnny King, all he could do was praise Hal, saying what a good fighter he was, and he definitely has a future. He said I had to pull out that little bit extra to put him down. Hal's response to the reporter that went to him was, I've learned a great deal in that fight, so I'm going to go away and think about that. That was the start of his undefeated 10 years and 3 months. <clears throat> now, comparison, I don't know who you really compare a Hal Bagwell to, but for example, this is the greatest, self proclaimed greatest boxer on the planet, Muhammad Ali, he only had 61 fights. And a bit unfair, because all the ones at the top down are Bruno, they're heavyweights, they're the big boys. Johnny King, Morris Mancini, they're the ones, his generation, yeah, we're fighting. And Johnny King, you can see, he was pretty serious. <coughs> look how many he lost. If you look at Hal's record, based on what I've found so far, at 100, 85 won, 5 losses and 10 drawn. If you bear in mind, the Guinness Book of Records, they gave a figure between the, the start date of his 10 year, 3 months undefeated period to the end date, they get something like 180 fights, which is why they withdrew it, because they couldn't find 180 fights. There's no dispute that it wasn't 10 years and 3 months. Mm -hmm. So we've got 100 so far, but the 202 figures, the 180 plus the fights Hal had before that we could prove, and the fights he had afterwards. So that gives a starting point to how many fights potentially he had. All I have to do is find them. He was fighting during World War II, that sounds a bit strange, but there's a big gap between Dunkirk and D-Day. And I've got some evidence, and I found some more yesterday, of how having a fight, or planning to have a fight, in the break between the two. 
Uh, the actual fights, well, that is four figures, not three. Well, we'll come to that in a minute, and we have got evidence of that from the mouth of uh, Ron Taylor. So if you look at the four figure thing, and then compare it, change that hundred to four figures, and compare it with the others. In the scheme of who's the greatest boxer on the planet, which one would you say it was? So I'm, I'm banging that in because it's called, cool. if you keep saying the same thing, people will remember it. Yeah, 10 years and 3 months, those are the dates. No one on the planet disputes that fact. That's the longest period anyone's gone undefeated. They didn't record any fights until he was 17. None of his unofficial fights were recorded. No records during the war. He had exhibition fights throughout his career and after. During the war, he was raising money for the Red Cross and for prisoners of war. I think one of his brothers was a prisoner of war. Um, he was always going down to Montagas to make a few balls. It was easy cash, wasn't it? You know, it wouldn't last two rounds. Yeah? So that's a period of six years, unrecorded fights during World War II. <coughs> now, what was he doing during the war? The one we've got recorded on the 1st of February 1941, he fought Critch Hambly in Devonport in Devon at the Alhambra Hotel, and he won, obviously. Um, I've been looking for more, and I've spoken to the museum there, now, but it's difficult to find anything, because the Luftwaffe went over Davenport in later 1941, dropped loads of bombs on it, and it ceased to exist, and lots of its records. The one that confused me is that Hull was involved in Dunkirk. The evacuation of Dunkirk was between the 27th of May and the 5th, the 4th of June, sorry, 1940. So you think from June to February, when I tell you the story of Dunkirk, you'll uh, see why it would take him a long time <coughs> to recover. So I thought February, well, I kind of, yeah, maybe February, you might just get in time for that. With six, seven weeks of running eight miles a week and doing his sparring and stuff like that, he might be ready in February. But in September 1940, he, he had to get a sub to replace him for a fight. Kim Jeffries from Cardiff, he did very well. And that wouldn't have been planned in 1949 because he was off to war in Europe. That was planned after Dunkirk. Now I don't know what the issue is, I'm yet to go find it. But Hal was ready to step back in the ring after about eight weeks. After Dunkirk. So you think, well, maybe that's not a big deal. You know, I've been to Dunkirk a few times. It was a little bit different when Hal went there. Because he was in the territorials, they were going to training camps down in Devon and Cornwall, places like that. And it was always a bit of a jolly, like a summer break for the soldiers to play soldier games. 1939 suddenly got very, very serious because this little man with a moustache in Europe was starting to play his face a bit. How left the last training camp in 1939 on the way back, he said, I don't think we're going to have time to get our uniforms off before we're back into them. And he was right because almost immediately he found himself in Europe as the Germans poured across Europe. The Gloucesters were used to hold the Germans back so they could get guys off in Dunkirk. Now, at one point, they were facing crack German troops, I think, the SS, and uh, the Gloucesters were told to fix bayonets and push them back, which they did on a charge, but they were outnumbered and soon overwhelmed, and all the officers started shouting, every man for himself. Hal broke off with 20 to 30 of the Gloucesters and tried to get back to Dunkirk. That was 10 miles away, through planes coming in, dropping bombs on them, machine guns, tanks all over the place. They were wading through dead bodies and burning vehicles, trying to make it back. As when he gets to Dunkirk, the scary bit is he stops talking about the 20, 30 blokes. 
So I assume he was there by himself. He doesn't mention anyone else. So he's lying on the beach. Three days, three nights, no food, no drink. Every time there's a rumour, there's a boat coming in. He's wading out into the sea, getting upset because there's no boat to pick him up, wading back in. There are thousands of troops there, English, French. Eventually, he gets back on the beach and just collapses with exhaustion. An officer from the Wessex Regiment came over and said, strangely, are you all right, soldier? And Hal said, no, I haven't eaten or drunk for three days. I think I'd be better off if I was dead. So the officer pulled a bar of chocolate out of his pocket and told Hal to uh, get it inside him. After a few minutes, he came round a little bit and the, the officer told him, I've heard a rumour there's a boat coming in tonight on the old pier. I'll go and see if it's true. So off he went. Hal never expected to see him again, but he did return. He said, it is coming in. Pick your kit bag up and your rifle, let's go. So Hal eventually got up on his feet, collapsed three times on the way to the old pier. When they got there, the, uh, the officer rolled him into the boat. Hal said one of his big regrets was he never got his name. He never knew who he was. But he arrived safely home. And uh, within eight weeks started fighting. He fought all the way through raising money, and then he was involved in Operation Overlord, D-Day. And that's a slightly scarier story than the Dunkirk one. Somebody must have been looking over how bad